Good afternoon, folks. I can see that we have some people rolling in. Um, we're going to take a little bit of time to let you guys get settled into place before we get started. Um, this will probably be the last time you hear my voice behind this photo. Then we're going to transfer everything on over to the experts in the room who will be able to give you guys all the good, helpful information uh, and the rules for the evening. But we're going to give you a little bit of time to have people get into the Zoom before we get started. All right, team, it looks like we might have hit a pause here. Um, and you guys can get ready, get started whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Well, welcome everybody. Um, we are excited to speak to you all today. Um, my name is Ann Strickland um, and I serve as an assistant director in the Office of Student Leadership Development here at William & Mary. So our office um, oversees all student organizations, um, student assembly, um, leadership programs, as well as fraternity and sorority life. Um, and I'm going to let um, my colleague Joe introduce himself. Hi, everyone. My name is Joe Wheelis, and I'm also an assistant director for student, for student leadership development with and working with Anne to oversee our fraternity and sorority community. Um, and we are so excited to um, speak to you all today. Um, we like to view this presentation as just a general overview of the fraternity and sorority community here at William Mary. There will be time for questions at the end. Um, feel free to use the Q&A feature as well as um, if you want to use the chat, you can. Q&A tends to work a little bit easier, but up to you guys. Um, we will be trying to monitor all of those. And like I said, we'll get to a lot of specific questions you guys might ask at the end, but feel free to drop them in anytime. Um, and we are just excited to talk to you guys about our community. Um, so our community um, is consists currently of three governing councils. So we have the National Pan-Hellenic Council or MPHC, the Interfraternity Council and the Pan-Hellenic Council. So we're gonna spend some time today going over all three of those councils and their membership practices um, and what are the things you need to know about our community. Um, but in total, we make up about 30 different fraternities and sororities across those three councils. Um, we also have one chapter without a council, um, which is our chapter of SIA, which is our Latinx sorority here on campus that does not fall under a specific council at this time. Um, we make up about 1,600 members of the William Mary community. That's about 26% um, of the current undergrad. So um, we are a, a large community here on campus, but we are by no means the only community on campus or by no means do we make up um, a majority of the community on campus. So some schools you may be going to may have higher percentages. Um, we kind of like staying around that 25 to 33% of campus. Um, we really, um, so we, we have a presence um, and you may feel our presence when you get on campus, but by no means are we the only opportunity um, on campus and by no means are we the majority of students on campus. Oh, Joe, you're on mute still. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start talking a little bit about how um, students join. There are there are three primary avenues to joining. I'm going to give a little bit of a quick overview of each one, and then we're going to go into a little bit more detail. Uh, but I will, as Ann mentioned, this is kind of a high level overview. So um, the, the thing with fraternities and sororities is it can get really complicated really quickly. So we want it, we have a limited amount of time. So if there are any questions after this, um, we'll make sure to include our contact information. Uh, membership intake is um, a one of the processes uh, of joining, and our uh, Black Greek Letter organizations and our uh, Latinx sorority are the six organizations that do this type of um, of, of joining. Um, so that's membership intake. Um, the IFC fraternity recruitment. Um, is applies to 14 of our fraternities. Um, you have them listed here. Um, and that's 
that happens at least twice a year um, at the beginning of each semester. Uh, and then next is Panhellenic sorority recruitment. It uh, applies to 10 of our sororities. Um, the largest or most um, structured process happens at the beginning of the fall semester. And there um, are sometimes some opportunities in the spring semester. So that's just the quick overview um, of all three joining processes. Um, you wanna go to the... Um, so the, yeah. the first process is our membership intake process, like Joe said. So six chapters at White Mary, we just listed the six chapters. They're who participate in membership intake. Um, the, the thing that we like to go over with this presentation is we wanna kind of show you, okay, if you get to campus and you're interested in these organizations, what are things to work on to go through that process? What are the ways um, to join that group? Um, and then also for maybe some of the, the parents on the call, also some questions to ask things to think through. So for membership intake, um, a big consideration there is GPA. So with membership intake, um, you do have to have at least some credit hours to join these organizations. So um, you'll need to be in um, most, most organizations in your second, at least your second semester of college. Um, some organizations limit joining until your sophomore junior year. The details for all the specific organizations and their requirements are listed on our website, um, on our membership intake page, um, and we go into specifics about each organization. Um, you also have to have letters of recommendation to go through intake. So one of the things um, that you can do if you're interested in joining um, is maybe start talking to people in your communities now um, who may be mentors, teachers, family members in your life who may be members of these organizations or may um, know some people that are members of these organizations to start talking to them about their experience um, to sort of gauge interest and also if they're people that are um, in your life, those might be people that you could ask to write a letter of recommendation um, if you intend to join. Um, also, they look for demonstrated service to the community. So um, all of our organizations, our MPHC organizations specifically, um, do um, look at community service. What have you done in high school? What do you do when you get to William Mary's campus um, to join, um, as well as um, demonstrated interest in these organizations? So like we said, um, when we talk about Panhellenic recruitment and IFC recruitment in just a little bit, you can join those, right? You can get on campus and join those organizations in your first few weeks here. But with these organizations, because you can't join right when you get to campus, they also look for people that are interested in their organization. So um, we have fairs at the start of the year, different organization fairs, places where you can go meet the students in these organizations, talk to them. That's a great way to show interest. Um, attending their events. Um, all of these organizations that participate in intake are super active on Instagram. Um, a lot of them are participating in the organization days for digital DFAS. So um, be on the lookout for that if you're interested in specific questions about these organizations. Um, they're all really happy to reach out. But the membership intake process is a super individual process for each of these organizations. So um, again, the two processes we're going to talk about are a lot more coordinated on a council-wide basis. These organizations run their processes by chapter. Um, so looking up the different chapters and reaching out to them directly is a great way to learn more. Also things like parents, families can do to learn more about these organizations. Talk to people in your local community um, about their experiences. Um, read up online um, about the different organizations, what they stand for. Um, their legacies of service and activism are pretty well documented. Um, and it's a great way to learn more about these organizations. Um, and always, you know, just remember that it is your student's decision whether or not um, they join an organization. So um, especially with our MPHC organizations, um, we do tend to see a lot of legacy there. Um, but it's it's your student's choice and your student's choice for the, the organization that's the best fit for them and the, the best opportunity for them. Um, and so as you do your research and look into it, keep that in mind. Um, no one should feel obligated to join an organization because of family legacy. Um, you should join the organization that's the right fit for you. Anything I missed, Joe? Nope, I think you covered it all. Okay, great. So IFC fraternity recruitment is um, a, a mix of council structured and individually driven. Um, at the beginning of each semester, um, the Infraternity Council will publish a calendar, they will do a registration event, there will be a registration process to officially indicate that you are going through 
um, fraternity recruitment. Uh, and then the chapters will publish um, open house events. Um, they will hold multiple, multiple events over the course of the three week period and throughout the entire semester. Um, definitively, every chapter is going to have an event the first weekend after classes start. Um, every, and, and that schedule will be all published at the, be, at the beginning of the semester. Um, but the student gets to direct which, how they go. Um, so we recommend the more chapters you visit, uh, the better informed you are to make a decision about which chapter you want to join. Uh, we also recognize that there are 14 IFC fraternities that are participating in this process. So um, trying to go to four, 14 different events in the first weekend, that could be a lot. Um, so really it's a self-directed process um, with IFC fraternities getting some structure. There are some eligibility requirements um, around GPA. You have to have at least a 2.5 GPA um, and no um, uh, currently on suspension or probation from the university, uh, but incoming students who it's their first semester are not required to have, the, to meet the GPA standard um, your, first, your first semester at Weaver Mary. So um, some other things to consider um, when you are going through IFC fraternity recruitment, have you met enough men in the chapter that you enjoy spending time with? Um, how does it compare to other chapters that you, um, you've visited or, or met people in? That's where the self-directed piece comes in. Um, potential new members that go through recruitment, um, if they visit one or two chapters, may enjoy where they go, but sometimes um, we find, for the most part, we find that more chapters you go to, the better informed you are, the better experience you're gonna have. Um, asking questions about the time, uh, the time commitment. Um, and will it hurt to join the first semester or not? Uh, about 60% of our students don't join in the, um, join in the first semester. So about 40% of our students who join are sophomores, seniors, um, and some seniors. So one of the things that you will hear us uh, mention um, is at the beginning of the fall semester, it can seem like um, everybody is going through recruitment because IFC fraternities and panel and sororities are in the midst of the largest part of their largest recruitment cycle. Um, so it seems like everybody's joining. But if you look at the numbers that we just talked about at the beginning, um, there are plenty of students that we were married who are not in a fraternity or sorority. Um, so it is okay to wait um, a semester or even a year um, if you decide you don't want to join. You can go to you can go to parts of recruitment. Um, and not have any commitment, uh, monetary or signing um, a, a bid for membership. Um, so you can test the waters. Um, and if you're like, I just got a lot going on this first semester, I'm gonna wait, that's totally fine. Plenty of students do. Some things that uh, parents and families should consider. Um, what does your student want out of fraternity experience? Ask them this question and students should be thinking what, the, what that answer would be. Um, what are the housing requirements? Um, we'll kind of touch on this a little bit more in detail later on, uh, but we house, excuse me, um, a lot of our chapters occupy on-campus fraternity and sporting housing, and there are some requirements that chapters have to live in those facilities. Um, and again, as Ann already mentioned, remember, it's your student's decision. There are legacy parts to um, IOC fraternity recruitment, um, but there are a lot of chapters um, that participate in this process um, and that every chapter has its own separate culture and identity um, that may um, be beneficial to one, or attractive for one student and not the other. So again, it's your student's decision to go through the process, uh, but having an open, upfront and honest conversation about what that experience should look like is definitely something parents and families should look for. And then the last process um, that we are going to talk about today is the Panhellenic sorority recruitment process. Um, I like to preface this conversation by saying, um, especially to prospective students and students considering coming here to William & Mary, um, William & Mary students are William & Mary students. That means that our fraternity and sorority life looks like fraternity and sorority life made up of William & Mary students. 
So if you have friends that are going to, or maybe are at different schools, um, we were laughing earlier, I went to um, a big SEC school for my undergrad um, experience. That experience looks very different because of the school that I went to um, and the students that made up that school versus the students that are here at William & Mary. So if you're, if you're on the fence about joining, um, we always like to say, get here, meet the students, um, get to know them, um, and then make your decision. Because what you may have in your head of what fraternity and sorority life looks like or what Panhellenic recruitment looks like um, may be very different than what you're expecting um, because of the students that we have here on campus at William & Mary. So Panhellenic sorority recruitment, um, registration for that does open in mid-July. These are for those 10 Panhellenic um, chapters we have here on campus. Um, recruitment is going to start on Friday, September 10th um, and run through Sunday, September 19th. Um, typically, we'd have a schedule already published. Like I could tell you word for word what's going to happen. Um, I think that it's um, pretty um, clear, I'm sure for all of you, that we're not really sure what the fall semester is going to look like. Um, same with recruitment. We're not entirely sure um, what that's going to look like for us either. So um, I think one of the things that we are still navigating is what the recruitment process is going to look like, the time commitment, things like that. So just bear with us as we move through the summer. Um, and if you are interested in joining um, as a freshman right when you get to campus, um, just pay attention to our social media and different email communications we send out because we are going to keep you informed. Um, the biggest difference about the Panhellenic recruitment process versus the other recruitment processes that we've discussed on this call um, is that you are required to visit all 10 chapters. So it's the philosophy of the Panhellenic Council that um, all, 10 of our, all 10 of our chapters are great um, and that we want everybody to find a home in the chapter that's right for them, but we want you to consider and give a fair look to all 10 of our chapters. So what that means is that the process is designed to where you do attend all 10 chapters. You are required to attend all 10 chapters and get to know all of them. Um, our process also is a process of mutual selection. Um, so that means that the chapters are picking who they want at the same time the women are picking where they would like to go back to. Um, things that students should consider if they're thinking about going through our process. Um, is do you want to join a specific chapter? Or do you want to join a panel and sorority? So um, this also applies. We would we want you to come to William and Mary. We're trying to convince you to come to William and Mary. And also, if you go somewhere else, please also heed this advice, right? Um, if you come through a Panhellenic recruitment process and you only want to join one chapter, your chances of joining that one chapter are one in, for us, it's about one in eight or one in 12. I calculated it the wrong way. I already told you I went to an SEC school and wasn't smart enough to go to William & Mary. Um, so you're in that like one in 12 range, right? So you, um, you've limited your chances significantly of joining a chapter um, here on campus because you're only interested in that one chapter. Um, our process is designed for you to get to know all 10. So come in with an open mind and be prepared to meet all 10 chapters. Um, and there are 105 women um, on average in all of our chapters. Um, that means that like you're probably going to get along with different people in each chapter and that there's probably someone you can get along with in every single one of our chapters. Um, there's many types of people that make up each group. Um, so getting to know them and giving each group a fair shake is really vital and really important in our process. And also think about what are you looking to get out of the sorority experience? Joe mentioned this um, with the Interfraternity Council, but um, our experiences are truly what you make of them, right? If you come in and you only want one experience, you can get that one experience out of it, but you're not going to have a great experience and you're not going to take advantage of all fraternities and sororities have to offer you. Um, so really think through what do I want out of this experience and which chapter as I'm going through seems to show me that they're going to give me what I want out of that experience. Um, please keep all of that in mind. Um, lots of people talk about this process being a big, scary um, process to go through. I'm here to tell you that it's not. Um, I'm here to tell you that it can be a really great process if you commit to it um, and commit to seeing the process through. The things for parents and families to consider um, in the Panhellenic re recruitment process and for our Panhellenic chapters um, is that the recruitment process um, is not always an easy process um, and that there tend to be tears sometimes. Um, but the big thing for families to know um, is that um, sometimes they're happy tears, sometimes they're sad tears. Um, it can be a lengthy process. And so um, sometimes that can cause um, some stress. But again, I'm here to tell you, 
it is all going to be okay. Um, students also have a recruitment counselor to help them through the process. So students that choose to go through the Panhellenic recruitment process um, are matched with a recruitment counselor whose job it is to help them through the process. They're a current active Panhellenic sorority member um, here on campus. Um, and so they um, have been through the process um, and they just wanna help give you advice um, and help you through. Um, we also, again, all 10 organizations do provide a comparable experience. Um, and, you know, again, it's your student's decision. Guys, um, I know we have a lot of students on the call. Do not let anyone, family, friends, significant other, whoever tell you which organization you should join and have to join. You need to join the organization that is right for you or don't join an organization because it's not right for you, but it needs to be your decision um, because it's going to be your experience. And if you let other people make the decision for you or influence your decision, um, you may not end up with the experience that you wanted. Um, we did get a question from someone asking what's the difference between a chapter and a Panhellenic sorority. So all of our organizations are considered chapters of a national organization. So that means that they are local groups affiliated with a national organization. Um, so we do sometimes use those words interchangeably, um, but Panhellenic sororities are, um, are the 10 chapters that fall under the National Panhellenic Conference um, that participate in the Panhellenic recruitment process. So we have Panhellenic chapters, we have IFC chapters, and we have MPHC chapters. Um, so that um, is how that plays out. And um, I'm going to turn it over um, to Joe to move on to our next slide. And I know we've gotten a few more questions, but we will answer these um, in just a minute when we get to the Q&A. Okay, so some additional family considerations um, that we should just We've, we've kind of mentioned some of them, but we're going to talk a little, dive a little bit more deeply into it. And if you could advance. Um, um, I know we got a question of, are you able to provide an estimate on average cost? Um, the organ these organizations do cost money. Um, we aren't able to provide you with the average cost right now because that is um, the it's variable and a lot of chapters right now will be spending time over the next couple of months setting their budgets for next year. Um, I know both are both IFC and Panhellenic um, as councils are working on um, financial transparency documents that will be part of and published um, right as the recruitment period starts, um, but we won't be able to give you accurate data. If we were to tell you stuff today, um, it is very likely that that will be out of date um, within a couple months. So we're not able to give you an average cost. Um, the MPHC organizations, I can tell you a big difference when it comes to cost um, is those organizations tend to require a lot of upfront costs during the intake process um, that goes along with your application. And the annual cost year after year are not as high. Um, so it can range anywhere from, from a thousand to $3,000 um, for an MPHC organization. So that's why we strongly recommend that um, saving money is part of the family conversation. If a student decides they want to join. Um, these organizations are not covered are, are out of pocket um, expenses. So it is not covered by financial aid. Um, it's not part of the tuition and fees at William and Mary. Um, fraternities and sororities are external, um, even though they're recognized student organizations. Um, from a financial standpoint, you're paying that that chapter or that national organization. Um, for a lot of our chapters, uh, at least 22, 23 of them, um, there may be housing involved. Um, all of the houses that we um, have at William & Mary are university owned, they're just like, um, uh, all, they're just like residence halls. Um, and the students that live in those, actually that part can be covered by financial aid because it is, um, a William and Mary fee, it's part of your room and board. So um, each chapter is different in terms of what it requires, but I can tell you that um, residence life requires freshmen to live in a freshman residence hall their first year. So if you join um, a fraternity or sorority during your freshman year, you will not be eligible to move into the, into the on-campus house until your second year, your sophomore year. Um, we Mary also requires that sophomores live on campus, 
So fraternity and sorority housing has been a great option for a lot of the students that join. Um, the chapters themselves tend to invest money into amenities for those houses. So um, some of the fraternities have weight rooms, some of the fraternities have kitchen um, appliances that uh, like coffee makers, um, a lot of the sororities um, do that as well. And students have a small kitchen um, that they can probably cook a meal or two um, during the week. And um, so it, it, one of the questions that we recommend that students ask up front is what's the housing requirement for your chapter? Um, some require open it up to sophomores and, and that's what they do. Some do GPA, some do um, rankings for various different involvement activities within the chapter. Um, the hard part is that every chapter makes those decisions differently. One uh, resource that we have is um, that we Mary puts together. It's on our, uh, you can access it through either the Fraternity Story Life website or the um, Community Values and Restorative Practices website. Uh, that is the published organizational conduct record. So student organizations that are on probation or have been removed from campus, uh, we publish those, um, that conduct for at least three years. Um, so there are um, some things on the website. Uh, that you, there's a drop down menu for the organizations um, that are listed there. So one of the things that we recommend everyone do, both parents, families, and students, is do your research. That is one place that we are providing some transparency of like what has the conduct been uh, for the high level conduct been for our organizations. Um, and, and a word of caution, just because something is on there for three years, um, doesn't mean that the organization is um, exactly the way it was three years ago when that incident happened. One of our main goals is educational outcomes. And so we want to, before we have to get to the point where we separate a chapter from, from the university, we want to make sure that we've done some educational interventions beforehand. So a lot of what you'll see um, is if it's, a, if it's an alcohol violation, we're going to choose educational measures first. Um, and the idea is that the culture of the chapter um, has changed based on that, that educational sanction. So um, if you see something that is supposed to come off um, the list this semester, um, that means it's at least three years old. So just keep that um, in mind when you're looking at what is on that website. And then Anna, there's one, yes. Um, harm reduction and prevention is also something that all of our organizations take in, um, that do both um, the university and Strickland and I provide some of that, but also the national organizations um, do a lot of the programming as well. So joining an active fraternity or sorority on our campus uh, means that they're also gonna get an extra layer of support when it comes to um, harm reduction and prevention measures around all the evergreen issues on a college campus, underage consumption of alcohol, um, drugs, hazing prevention, um, sexual misconduct prevention. All of that is going to be built into both new member and active, and active member education at all the levels. Um, and it comes from various different places, both William and Mary and the National Organization and also our umbrella organization. So um, the students, each student's gonna have a lot of access to a lot of that different uh, training that um, not your, that an unaffiliated student may not have access to. So that um, is the end of our presentation. I know we've gotten a couple of questions, so feel free to keep dropping them in, um, but we'll go ahead and start answering what we've gotten. Um, one person asked um, with um, Panhellenic sororities, um, does everyone get placed in a sorority that wants to be in one? Um, so technically not always. Um, I, I think the thing that I like to say is if you go through our process in good faith, um, and you are interested in joining one out of our 10, um, you will have the opportunity to join. Um, we tend to see, so there's no requirements to go through Panhellenic recruitment, um, but GPA sometimes is a factor. Um, conduct um, can be a factor, um, but a lot of you being prospective students, if you're choosing to go through as a freshman, um, you're, you're coming in with a blank slate um, so know that as you go through the process, um, but very, very few women um, get released in our process, um, but that does happen um, occasionally. Um, so I, I can't say that it doesn't happen, but I can say, again, if you go through our process in good faith, 
um, it, it is extremely rare to see in our process. Um, we also got a question about social sororities versus panelytic sororities. So the term social sororities is a term that a lot of our panelytic women use um, when they're on panels and they feel like they shouldn't necessarily disclose what chapter they're in. Um, it's a blanket term that they use. Um, we don't see a lot of our MPHC um, or CM members use that term. Um, so they are referring to panelytic chapters um, when they say social sororities. Um, our organizations are social in nature. Um, that, that's who we are. Um, and so that's kind of a blanket term um, to say you're in a sorority um, without naming the chapter specifically. So on some of these panels, um, you probably have heard them use that term. Um, we also just got the question, um, is it harder to rush as a sophomore than a freshman? Um, here at William Mary, the answer to that is no. Um, we see um, about 50% of our pool every year are freshmen going through, um, but the other 50% are mostly sophomores with some juniors and seniors going through. So um, really, if you want to come and wait, we have plenty of women um, choose to wait to go through recruitment until that they are a sophomore. Um, we also have opportunities to join um, in your second semester on a limited basis through our continuous open bidding process, meaning that some chapters may have spots available that they're able to offer in off semesters from formal recruitment. Um, but that process is really chapter driven um, and we don't know which chapters will be participating in recruitment in that, in that process, that continuous open bidding process until the start of the semester. So it's less of a guarantee and less of an opportunity to get to have your best shot at any of our 10 chapters than the formal recruitment process, but it's definitely an option um, for women. Um, going through our process. One one clarifying thing, and I think your 50% that you talked about, um, that was just panelytic recruitment. Whereas yeah. my my statistic earlier, 60% of joiners um, typically are freshmen. That's across all of our joining opportunities through the whole year. So if anyone's confused about those two different statistics, um, if you did if you dial in to each of the different joining processes, the, the number is a lot different. Um, typically, there are not a lot of first-year students or freshman students that join our MPHC organization. So that can, um, they're almost all exclusively um, sophomores or higher, um, or at least second semester freshmen. Um, got a question about, uh, for study abroad, um, whether you're doing a year or a semester, do students still need to pay dues while they're not on campus? Um, that depends. Most chapters have a special status for students that are abroad. They may have to pay a national fee that is a lot smaller than your normal semester, but typically um, if you're not on campus, um, you can either, it ranges from, you don't need to pay any dues, you may have to pay a little bit of dues. Um, I don't, we don't know a chapter that is charging students that are, some, that are studying abroad the full amount of dues um, for any semester, but it depends on the chapter and that's always a good question to ask during the recruitment process. One thing also um, that Joe and I like to say too, when you get on campus, um, like I said, we, we hope you're coming. Um, when you get on campus in the fall, because IFC and Panhellenic both do large joining opportunities in the fall, it can feel very much like everyone is joining as a freshman and I have to join as a freshman. Like, we gave you the stats, you truly don't have to join as a freshman and we have sophomores, juniors and seniors join our organizations every day. Joe and I like to say we're not a deferred recruitment campus, but we have lots of students who self select to defer. That's a totally okay option and to get your feet underneath you and, and really experience your freshman year here um, before deciding to join. Um, so don't get overwhelmed by the everyone is joining I have to join um, when you get here. Um, take your time. There's also time to talk to different people in your hall, um, orientation aides. Um, there's different fairs that you can go to um, and meet the different organizations and talk with them. Um, that's a really great opportunity to sort of gauge what you're interested in um, right as you came. Um, I got a question about the average cost for panel and exorities in 2019. Um, per semester, um, it tends to range anywhere from like 300 to 500, 600 a semester. Um, again, a lot of that, it varies deeply by chapter, mainly because you have different national fees, 
You also do tend to pay a little bit more upfront when you join. Um, so you tend to pay like buy your badge um, and that costs money, but that varies truly by chapter how much the badge costs. Um, some of the chapters, um, like Joe said, reduced their dues significantly um, over the last year um, because they weren't having any social events, which costs money. They weren't being able to do as many in-person events. Um, so they did um, cut back on their dues significantly. Um, so we're not sure what the 2021 dues structure will look like. Um, but again, I have seen Panhellenic organizations plan to participate in financial transparency where um, at least definitely for Panhellenic before you go through the process, you'll be able to see a full breakdown of the dues for the year. Um, but it does vary widely by chapter um, and the chapters can talk about that as well. I don't see any other questions. But there's one in the chat. Um, oh. I don't know if you want to take that one or you want me to take that one. Can you talk a little bit about diversity within the Greek system? Um, sure. Um, this is a topic, diversity within our, our the fraternity sorority community is a topic that is um, constantly on our student leaders' minds um, in working to be more open, accepting, um, and welcoming to um, diverse a diverse array, array of students. And that they are very cognizant that it is beyond just uh, racial diversity. It's also socioeconomic status, um, gender identity, sexual orientation. Um, it, however you define diversity. And so our students are working on making sure that their chapters and community is opening and welcoming and accepting. It's a constant, um, it's a, the, the work is constant, the harvest is plentiful, if you will, um, and they're working on some internal, like different initiatives, um, making sure that everyone is aware of, um, or educating themselves on various different ways to talk with people, how to be more accepting and open, um, as well as making sure that our recruitment processes are accessible to all, um, to everyone. Um, so, I don't have anything to report at the moment that our students are actively doing because a lot of the things that they're talking about are in process. Um, but we hope to see some um, uh, some publicized things over the next over the coming months, um, specifically around recruitment. The the difficulty here from where we sit, uh, both Ann and I, is that the chapters are the ones making membership decisions, um, and we as university administrators can't go into a chapter meeting and say, here's what you have to do in terms of taking uh, members. So we're working a lot with to complement what a lot of the national organizations are doing as well. So diversity, equity, inclusion training is um, always on the docket of things that we need to address and work on and it's constantly being um, pursued. Did, is there anything you want to add, Ann? Yeah, I, I think the other thing too is like, I think we can all acknowledge that our organizations um, across all three councils um, have all in many ways been drawn along, along different race and gender lines. Um, so, but all of our organizations today um, are accepting um, of people from all walks of life to join their organization. So, you know, I, I think there's in the IFC and Panhellenic organizations, um, started out as exclusively white organizations and our organizations here um, do not want to be exclusively white organizations, um, have not been for a long time, but still have work to do in terms of creating more inclusive and welcoming spaces and are constantly having that conversation and trying to figure out ways to make those communities more accessible. In the same way, our MPHC organizations, which are historically black organizations, those organizations have significant ties to black culture and the black community, but in no way are they black exclusive organizations. Um, all of our organizations truly want to be a welcoming space to anybody. Um, anybody that wants to join, um, they are specifically men's organizations and women's organizations. Um, but most organizations do define that um, as anyone that identifies as a woman or anyone that identifies as a man, um, meaning that they are welcoming um, and trans inclusive organizations. 
um, they fall under the how do you identify a spectrum. Um, so things to also consider. Um, we've also gotten a lot of um, questions about um, panelitic recruitment. So um, when do we expect more information about scheduled dues meeting recruitment counselors? Um, when Panhellenic Recruitment Registration launches in mid-July, um, we'll be sending out a lot more information and have a lot of information built out on the website around what we expect recruitment to look like and the timeline. Um, Panhellenic Recruitment, like I gave you the dates earlier, it occurs a couple weeks into the start of the semester. So after orientation, um, there's about a week, um, week and a half, and then recruitment starts. So um, you do have a little bit of time once you get to campus um, to decide whether or not you're interested in joining. Um, and there'll be lots of information distributed when you get to campus, as well as some before in that kind of July, August range. Um, if you go through IFC recruitment or Panhellenic recruitment, you are not required to join. Um, if you get all the way to the end of the Panhellenic recruitment process and accept a bid from a chapter, um, there can be consequences if you choose not to join that chapter um, because you took a spot away from somebody else um, that might have been interested in joining that chapter. But if that's a decision you're navigating all the way at the end of our process, our recruitment counselors and recruitment team are happy to sort of talk you through that. Um, but there's no commitment to just start the process. Um, there's no fee to start the IFC process or the Panhellenic process. Um, Panhellenic um, Women going through Panhellenic recruitment do pay a $30 fee to um, participate in the second weekend of recruitment. Um, but to start the process and sort of feel it out, um, there is no fee and there's no penalty to start and not join. Um, that also leads into, can you still participate in Panhellenic recruitment if you have a tough first semester schedule slash how much time do we need to plan to commit to recruitment? Um, so the intention with recruitment is that it, Panhellenic recruitment is that it only occurs over two weekends, so Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for two weekends. Um, we may, um, again, depending on some COVID things, have to extend some stuff maybe into Thursday night a little bit or a Monday night, um, but the intention is that it should not interfere with um, schoolwork. Um, that's why we try to have them on the weekends, um, and we encourage people to plan ahead. We try to do it towards the beginning of the semester so you have less homework, um, less commitments you're trying to get done, um, so we don't interfere too much with classes, um, but really it's mainly that weekend time frame, um, and we're really willing to work with people too if you have class coming up um, or something you're working on. Um, our community uh, is very understanding um, because we're all William Mary students um, of classwork and that that comes first and how do we fit that in. But again, with, with these chapters, it's really what you make of it. Um, you tend to have in the semester you join a new member meeting, and then you may also have a chapter meeting um, and some events that will be occurring on weekends that you can attend. Um, but it, it tends to be a pretty minimal time commitment um, unless you really want to participate in, and kind of go full in. Um, and then there's more opportunities for you to engage in. Um, but these are William Mary students. Classes and academics comes first. Um, and our chapters are really, really lenient around um, responsibilities to them um, when um, they know classwork is involved. Yeah, I think that answers all the questions we have so far. Anything else? There are no bad questions. And if you don't feel comfortable asking it here, um, Joe and I have our email addresses on the slide. So take those down or take your phone out and screenshot it, um, save it. All of this also lives on our website. So if you go to wm.edu backslash FSL, um, you can get to all of this information and more. A lot of the information about recruitment is still from the 2020 um, recruitment cycle. So there's information there about how those processes worked. Um, feel free to read that. No, it might change for the next year, um, but it's good information to think through um, these processes and what we have going on. Um, but um, any other questions before we go? All right, it looks like we might have gotten to the end up. It looks like a question just popped up. Really? Yeah. 
You got this one, Jeff. How common is it for students to do ROTC and rush at the same time? That's a good question. And um, fun fact, Ann and I were actually just talking about this before our session started. Um, I, in my time here, there's only been a small number of ROTC students. Um, I joined, I started at William Mary in 2013. Um, so I would say there's not a lot of ROTC students that join a fraternity um, because there's a lot of obligations uh, from the ROTC side. Uh, but if you're like any student that joins a fraternity and also is whether you're a student athlete um, or you're heavily involved in other parts of the community, um, there are, your fraternity experience doesn't have to be your only experience. It can be part of a lot of things that you do on campus. So I think the best thing to do is to figure out what your obligations for ROTC are, because some of those are, especially if you have an ROTC scholarship, those come first, um, and then figure out what you want out of a fraternity experience. And if you think that you can fit it in, great. Um, it doesn't happen a lot, um, but it has happened before. Um, I think I saw another one. What's our favorite thing about um, fraternity and sporting life? Um, I mean, I think at its core, fraternity and sorority life is about relationships and connecting you with people and, and helping you kind of find um, who, who you want to spend the next four years with. Um, that doesn't mean that it's exclusive to fraternity and sorority life, but I think for me, um, it was sort of the thing that helped me get through college, the thing that um, convinced me to be, I was super involved in student government in college. It was, that was a big piece of it for me. Um, and I think in this role, it's watching students, um, you get a lot of opportunity in a fraternity or sorority to take on leadership roles and, and really get a lot of experience. And Joe and I get to work really closely with those students. And I think watching students grow and learn and um, become really strong leaders um, by the time they graduate um, is kind of a unique piece to the job we get to do um, and really keep keeps me coming back, keeps me doing it. Um, yeah. So what about you? I would say my favorite thing in, in addition to the relationships is that our students, our students come to the table ready to do the work and to have, be engaged in the hard conversations um, and the outputs of a lot of those conversations of the work that they want to engage in is is really quality um, and so I think our community um, we have a lot of national organizations that are interested in starting a chapter at William & Mary because of the type of student that attends William & Mary so um, they see the value add um, that our students bring to their organizations as a whole and that's really something special to be part of. that covers it tish yep i think that might be it so i i guess we will say goodbye to you guys and thank you so much for hanging out with us um and we have we've learned a ton i know i have um if you guys do have any questions definitely feel free to reach out to ann and to joe um and they'll be happy to answer some i'm answering for them but we'll be happy to answer some of those questions after the fact as well um and you guys have a really great rest of your day thanks a lot for hanging out with us Thank you. Bye, guys.